Hi there, this is Pastor John from Portland Metro Assembly of God Church. It's Sunday, September 27th, 2020. Very special time in our calendar, and we have been called by God to seek His face, to pray and repent and return to Him. The, today, the message that I'd like to share with you is about that sacred assembly, that return to God. And I want to break that down for you. But as we begin, I'd like to read for you Joel chapter 2, beginning of verse 12. Old, Old Testament prophet Joel uh, telling us <clears throat> about the sacred assembly, the solemn assembly. It says in Joel chapter 2, beginning of verse 12, That is what the Lord says. Turn to me now while there is time. Give your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Who knows, perhaps he will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this curse. Perhaps you will be able to offer grain and wine to the Lord your God as before. Blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, and even the babies. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar. Let them pray. Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your possession, your special possession, become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for your word. and Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to this time of returning to you, of seeking your face. And Lord, we pray your blessing on this time in your word. Lord, as we come, to fast and pray to you for our own lives, for our families, for our neighbors, Lord, for our city, for our nation. We pray, O God, that your Holy Spirit will come and help us. We pray, O God, that your Holy Spirit will fill us. We pray, O God, that you will lead us in our time of prayer and repentance. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, as we gather and as we talk about having a sacred assembly, let me tell you that first of all, it's a time to come together to pray and seek God, to draw near to him and to to uh, seek him, to turn from other things and and reset our priorities to seek after God. The second thing is, it is a time to come together to hear the words of God. The people of Israel would gather together and have God's word literally read to them. And they would stand all day long and hear the word of God read aloud to them. They would offer sacrifices and repent of their sins. And they would return to the Lord their God. And that's why the Lord had uh, called them and set up the privilege and the exercise, the experience of the solemn assembly. The third thing that I want to bring your attention to is Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We're going to read those in a minute. Let me back up to chapter 2 of Second Chronicles. In chapter 2, the preparations are made for the building of the temple. All of the uh, building materials are gathered and the plans are laid out. In chapter 3, the temple is built. A lot of hard work, difficult labor, uh, 
Uh, it was a huge uh, undertaking of a wonderful building and grounds to house and to give the people an opportunity to be in the presence of God. In chapter 4, all the furnishings are brought into the temple. I won't list them all because I, I don't want to uh, miss something uh, that is a study in itself, all of the furnishings, and they all point to Jesus. It is a powerful study, but then in chapter 5, to bring in the most important part, to be inside the temple and inside the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the temple. It, what a special moment. It was and must have been awesome. Chapter 6, Solomon gives praise to God and prays the prayer of dedication for the temple. And, and it, is, it is not a short, brief prayer. It is a long prayer. Uh, of dedication, but also of commitment to God, commitment to meeting God and committing uh, himself and the nation of Israel to be the people who would be the people of God and the people that would seek God with all their hearts. And then in chapter 7, the temple is dedicated. And I want to read uh, verses 1 through 16 of Second Corinthians chapter 7 for you. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because of the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle, 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their assigned positions and so did the Levites who were singing. His faithful love endures forever. They accompanied the singing with music from instruments King David had made for praising the Lord. Across from the Levites, the priests blew the trumpets while all Israel stood. Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings there because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrificial fat. Verse 8, for the next seven days... Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from as far away as Libohamath in the north and brook, the brook of, of Egypt in the south. In the eighth day, they had a closing ceremony for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival of shelters for seven days. Then at the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home. They were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and to his people, Israel. Verse 11. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the consecration of the temple and the palace. Then one night, the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. 
At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops, or send plagues among you. Verse 14. Then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. Second Chronicles chapter 7. In those verses that we just read, as the temple is being dedicated, God sends fire from heaven and burns up all the sacrifices. And his presence fills the temple. His presence filled the temple so much that the priests could not enter because the presence of the Lord had filled it. Oh, friends, what a, what a wonderful picture of the presence of the Lord, the power of the presence of the Lord and, and the glory of the presence of the Lord. It, the Bible says the people saw the fire from heaven and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple and they responded by falling down on their faces to the ground and worshiping and praising the Lord. Oh, how awesome that must have been and how wonderful it is when we have those worship experiences like that where we feel the manifest and glorious presence of the Lord. Oh, friends, if you have not ever experienced that, it is so important that you do. If, if it has been a long time since you have experienced that, it is so important that you get back to the presence of the Lord. Get back to his presence in your personal prayer life with your family. Get back to the presence of the Lord in your church. Get back to having the awesome presence of the Lord in your life. The Bible says that the people celebrated the Jewish feast of shelters or booths for seven days. And on the eighth day, King Solomon sent the people home. And I, I love that verse, uh, 2 Chronicles seven ten, where it says they were all uh, joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and his people Israel. That was a beautiful event. And it leaves us with that great passage that reminds us now of that we as Christians and Jews alike, if we will turn from our wicked ways, if we'll seek the face of the Lord, then he will heal our land. Let me, let me, uh, let me back up just a little bit. The, the fourth thing that I want to talk to you about is a solemn assembly is a time to repent and to return to the Lord. You and I need to take this time, this special day right now, this special moment right now, and repent and return to the Lord. Maybe you don't feel like you're distant from the Lord or a long ways from the Lord, friends, we can always repent. We can always return. And there are times when, when like even now, we can repent for our city and we can repent for our nation. We can cry out to God for forgiveness and mercy. Solomon in Second Chronicles 7 completes the building of the temple and the royal palace. And then those famous words, and then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon. And I want to break down those, those four phrases, five, to be complete. First of all, he said, if my people who are called by my name. And, and thankfully, 
that includes us as New Testament Christians. It is, it is speaking to the Jews, to the nation of Israel, but it is also speaking to you and I as modern-day Christians called by the name of Jesus. And then the next phrase says, will humble themselves and pray. He's speaking to a very specific group of people, and then he he says, if we will humble ourselves and pray. Those two words must always go together, humility and prayer. We, we cannot find God's presence if we come in a, in a proud way. The Bible says, come humbly and boldly. And we can do that. We can come humbly and we can come boldly but not with pride in ourselves. Friends, and if we will humble ourselves and pray. And then the next, the third phrase, God says, and seek my face. That, that phrase, first of all, is saying, <laughs> don't come uh, asking for my hand. Don't, don't come asking for my hand to give you something or to provide something. No, you come seeking to see me. You come longing for my presence. Come longing for me. And then the fourth phrase says, and to turn from their wicked ways. That, that word turn is the word repent. You and I, when we come to have a solemn assembly or a sacred assembly to seek the Lord and to pray and to humble ourselves. It, it must always include repenting. We must always come to God and say, God, I am sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. Please forgive my family, God. Please forgive my city. Come and pour out your mercy on my city. And God will come and pour out his mercy on us as individuals, our families, our neighbors, our city, and our nation, if we will repent, if we'll say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Then that last phrase is the wonderful, gracious promise of God where he says, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal and restore their land. Well, friends, God's promises are, are, are yes and amen. God is always listening, especially when we come humbly and come praying and repenting. God is always listening and always ready to forgive. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or how bad. God is always ready to forgive. And he tells us that he will hear our prayer and will forgive our sins and heal our land. The fifth point that I want to share with you about the solemn assembly is it is a time to realize that we have fallen away. Maybe you could, you could put the word walked away in there. It is a time to realize that we have walked away from God. We have turned our back on God. And I want to take you to the, the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and bring out a couple of scriptures. First of all, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 says, But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And Jesus, I know here, is first of all talking to uh, the Ephesian church, and, and uh, it is the uh, point of that message, of that verse, that God wants you and I to come back to our first love, to the first and most important commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, 
God says, you say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Humility before God makes us aware of some very important things. When we come to God and repent, he is able to reveal some things to us. And, and I want us to break down those five words really quickly. And, and the first one is, God has said we're wretched, which means we're extremely unhappy. It, it probably expanded out means some other things, but it is a person that is extremely unhappy. The word miserable means a state of suffering, also a state of very unhappy, but also very uncomfortable. And we find ourselves in those conditions from time to time. The third one is poor. We don't realize we're poor, which means deserving pity. Very unfortunate. Uh, not not poor in the financial sense, but poor in the in the sense of we have had some circumstances in our life that have brought us unfortunate times, painful times. The fourth word is the word blind. And really what it is trying to get us to see is that that we are not seeing spiritually and we're not seeing physically. We have a physical blindness, but we also have a spiritual blindness. We, we are not hearing from God. We are not seeking after God. We are going our own way, and we are stumbling around in the darkness because we are blind. The last one is, is the word naked, and, and really it means that we are not clothed, and first of all, we are not clothed physically. We are not clothed as we need to be or as we should be in a physical sense. We are not covered. We're not covered under the umbrella of God's blessing. But we're also naked spiritually. We, we do not have the righteousness of Christ. We've wandered away. We've fallen away, and, and we do we are not walking in the righteousness of Christ. We don't have that protective covering of the righteousness of Christ all around us. And in, these, in this chapter, Jesus is speaking to different churches, and, and each one of the messages that he gives, he's uh, talking about a different time period as well. But over all is the message that we should repent, that we should return to him so that he can renew us and, and we can reconcile with God and get back to that right place with him. The first time the people of Israel had a sacred assembly, they gathered to hear the Ten Commandments. And I, I have them I want to read them to you, and I want to remind you that they are found in Deuteronomy chapter 5. That is the first place we find them. Later on, they're listed again, but, but here, is, here is the list in the first time that they are given in Deuteronomy 5. And as I read them, I want to invite you to, in this solemn assembly that we're having by way of video, I want to ask you to Ask God to forgive you for these sins, whether you feel like you've committed them or not. Just as, a, as an act of repentance and an act of cleansing, would you ask God to forgive you of these sins as I read them to you? The first one, you must not have any other God but God. And let's just ask the Lord, Father, forgive us for having other gods. Verse 
The second commandment says you must not make for yourself any idol. And Father, we just ask you to forgive us right now for the idols that we have allowed into our lives. And we ask you to forgive us, God. The third commandment says you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And Father, we ask your forgiveness for misusing the name of the Lord, misusing the name of God the Father, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Lord, when we are not talking to you or about you, we are misusing your name. And we ask you to forgive us. The fourth one is to keep the Sabbath holy. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for the sin of not keeping the Sabbath holy. Lord, you designed the Sabbath for worship and for rest. And we have, we have profaned it with many other things. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us. The fifth one is honor your father and mother. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for not honoring our father and our mother. Help us, O oh God, to get back to that place of, of honoring them. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. Number six, do not murder. <laughs> Father, we ask you to forgive us for murdering. Oh, God, your word says if we speak evil against someone, we are, we are guilty of murdering them. Lord, we have been guilty of murdering babies. We've been guilty of murdering people. Our, our streets all across America are stained with innocent blood, and we ask you to forgive us, God. Number seven says you must not commit adultery. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for both the, the physical adultery and the, the mental adultery, the spiritual adultery. We ask you, oh God, to forgive us of all of those. Number eight says you must not steal. Father, we ask you to forgive us for stealing. Lord, whether it's from our neighbor, Lord, the innocent kinds of stealing, Lord, taking whatever is not ours. If it doesn't belong to us, it's stealing, God. If we haven't paid for it or it hasn't been given to us, then it's stealing. We ask you to forgive us, God. Lord, number nine says, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us for that sin against you and against our neighbor. Help us, Lord, to only be people of the truth and forgive us, God. The Tenth Commandment says you must not covet your neighbor's wife, house, land, servants, animals, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for coveting things that belong to other people. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to repent and to change and to turn and to return to you, God. Go with us now, Lord, from this solemn assembly, this sacred time, and help us to be all that we can be for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.